uh, we rejoice with uh, Keith and, and Livy. Do be in continued prayer for Livy. Uh, Keith as well has some health issues, but especially Livy is still uh, undergoing treatment. So do continue prayer for her as well. Our uh, my message today, <clears throat> if you look in your bulletin, you can see it's entitled David and Goliath. A story that's no doubt familiar to us, and yet um, God puts these stories in the Bible for a reason. And yes, they are, first of all, to catch the interest of, of children. But I think God's word is more than just a, ta- you know, a book of children's tales. It has truth that we can apply to our hearts, and hopefully we'll find some of those truths today, some, some nuggets from, from God's word that we can uh, examine. So as we, as we look at this story, we read excerpts of it in our scripture reading today, let's, uh, let's first get the historical background. Now we know that uh, we're talking uh, around 1000 BC, so about 3000 years ago. Story of a of event that occurred with a number of people, but especially two, David and Goliath, three thousand years ago. So, what possible meaning could have that have for us today? Two obscure figures from three thousand years ago. Well, <clears throat> first of all, at least one of them is not obscure. He's a hero of the faith. He's King David. <clears throat> so, Israel had an ancient enemy, an enemy that was in the land before they were. The Philistines or Philistines. Um, now, King Saul had defeated the Philistines 27 years ago. Um, but they were back attacking the land, in part because of the sinfulness of God's people, in part because of the sinfulness of King Saul, especially himself. The author of 1 Samuel recounts the Lord's rejection of Saul, the prophet Samuel's isolation from him, and Saul's resulting melancholy. In chapter 16, we read of the Lord, that's Jehovah, the great I Am, the one who makes and keeps promises, the one who makes and keeps covenants, directing Samuel to anoint the king that God chose. Remember, Saul was the, the king the people chose. He's the one who stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Saul was a big, strong, impressive man, a handsome man, a popular man. He seemed to have all the attributes that a good king would require. But he was not God's choice. So Samuel goes as he's commanded to, to see the Jesse and his family. He did so with some trepidation. He did so, he expressed to God some worries. You know, if Saul hears of this, he's going to kill me. And God tells him not to worry about it and gives him some instructions about what to do and, and go. And of course, Sometimes we may be put in circumstances where we're clearly in God's will, and yet we may be in danger. Yet we can safely trust our God. We're immortal when we're in the center of God's will until it is his time to call us home. It was not Samuel's time. Now Samuel, when he went, he made the same mistake that the people did. So... He says to Jesse, I'm going to come and sacrifice with you. We're going to have a private ceremony. He went to the elders of the town and said we're going to have a sacrifice and then I'm going to have a private ceremony with with Jesse and his sons. And that was something that was not that unusual for the times. So they go in and 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 Samuel tells Jesse, I want you to bring me all your sons and uh, I'm going to anoint one of them. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us directly that Samuel told Jesse this, this was for the purpose of anointing one of your sons king, but I think they knew it. Um, if we kind of read between the lines, if we make inferences, I think that's the inference we could draw. So Jesse first sends out his oldest, Eliab. And Saul, Samuel took a look at him and went, oh, he's a 
handsome guys, big, strong, well built. Surely this is God's choice. God says, no, don't look on the outward appearance, look on the heart. I look on the heart. This is not my choice. Remember, it's our hearts that really matter with God. So on and on they went. Jesse had eight sons. He presented seven, seven of them. Every one, God said, nope, not this one. Nope, not that one either. Nope, 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 nope. Finally, Samuel looks at Jesse. Are there any more? He said, oh, yeah, there's my youngest son, David. He's out with the sheep. I didn't even think he was worthy of consideration. That's the implication. He says, send him in. God says, yep, that's the man. That's the one I want. He's got the heart that's going to serve me. So this occurred. We don't know exactly when in history compared to this battle with Goliath. But it was sometime prior. Also sometime prior, David apparently had established a reputation as a, as a good musician. Because we know in, at the end of chapter 16, just before the start of our story, David is called to the presence of Saul. Remember, Saul is now having demons attacking him at God's allowance because of his sinfulness. And the only way to calm his spirit and drive those demons away was David singing the songs that he had begun to run, to write the psalms that we, some of which we know. So, Samuel's in semi-retirement. Saul is, is somewhat functioning as a king, but in other ways not. And word of this gets to the Philistines. They choose to attack. And we can draw some lessons right away. We haven't even really gotten into, into the main story, but we can already draw some lessons, I think. If we're disobedient to God, he may allow physical or spiritual enemies to attack us. That's a, that's a scary thought. It should cause us to walk circumspectly, I think. Of course, if that were to occur for us, his purpose in it would be to drive us back to him. Saul never went back. Saul never... Saul was sorry for the, the outcome of his sin, but he wasn't really sorry for his sin. Saul never says, I'm a sinner. I sinned before you, like David does when he's confronted with his sin. If we confess with our mouths, Lord Jesus, if we confess our sinfulness, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Secondly, we see from Saul that if we become despondent, if we allow life circumstances to get us down to the point where we are barely functioning, and in some cases not able to function at all, well, we're opening the door for Satan and his forces to attack us. It's an easy avenue. You know, you're right. Life is, life, your life really does stink. You know, why would your God allow you to go through that? He's not worth obeying. He's not worth following. Who knows when you're going to die, but go, go enjoy yourself. We open ourselves to attack by the forces of evil. Saul opened himself to attack. <clears throat> so David, as we read the story, David was there, and we see that, or we're going to see that David would leave and go back to his task. Being with the sheep. Taking care of the sheep. Um... <clears throat> So we see through for in the end of chapter 16, Saul unwittingly advancing David, making him his armor bearer, making him his, his aide de camp, as it were. David having intimate fellowship with the king. You know, that sounds like a pretty good job. Three square meals a day, best of the food, best of the clothing, best of shelter. Getting to Rub elbows with the elite of Israel. 
But what does David do? Once Saul is no longer in need of his services, he's, he obviously must have asked Saul, okay, I need to go back and, and do my main job taking care of my father's sheep. Because you don't just do whatever you want with an Oriental king. That's a good way to get your head chopped off. He must have gotten permission from Saul to leave. Um, and we don't know how long he was gone. The implication was it was a, a while because towards the end of the chapter, Saul, well, who is this guy who just killed Goliath? Who is he? Well, it's the same guy who he had spent a lot of time with, with being sung to. So the logical conclusion was it was a couple, couple three years because, remember, David, we're told, is but a youth. He was a young teenager. Well, let's say he was gone for a couple of years. What do teenagers tend to do, you know, say age 13 to 15 or so? Right? They get bigger, they fill out, faces might change somewhat. You know, Saul remembered this guy. Now he's got this guy. Or maybe this guy, who knows how tall David was. So, <clears throat> some other conclusions, some other nuggets perhaps that we can draw. We see that apparently David's family didn't think very highly of him. We'll see this in the way his brother, oldest brother, treats him as well. Of course, older brothers tend to make life miserable, or older sisters might tend to make life miserable for younger sisters. Just, just saying. But, uh, and maybe that was part of part of the situation. But, it, but the implication I drew, or the inference I drew, was that some reason they didn't think too highly of of David. Um, maybe it was just he was the youngest, and therefore he got you know all the all the tasks that the others didn't feel like doing. But in any case, he had a job that wasn't so great. Being a shepherd, you're being when you're out being a shepherd, you're out in the fields all by yourself except for the sheep. Kind of lonely. Kind of boring most of the time, I imagine. You get dirty, you get smelly. Remember, shepherds, who did Jesus allow to see him first? It was shepherds, the lowest of the low. David was not thought of highly. You know, we'll get into this later, but I don't think I'd be a good shepherd. Because... If I saw a lion taking a lamb, enjoy that meal there, guy. Just glad you're not going after me. I'm out of here. We know what David did. And of course, we know what our Lord Jesus does. He didn't run from the lion, that lion that's seeking to devour us. No, he pulled us out of his jaws, didn't he? He brought us to himself smacked Satan a, a death blow. David got a better job, as I, as I told you. He was with King Saul, getting to time, spend time with him. So we see David showing him humility and obedience, going from a great job back to a pretty lousy job. He went back to his father and tended the sheep. Let's look in our Bibles, verse 12. Here we are, have David introduced to us. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah. Ephrath uh, must be a little, Bethlehem's not a big city, but Ephrath uh, must be even a smaller one out, just outside of Bethlehem. His name was Jesse. He was the son of Jesse. And Jesse, he had eight sons, and the man uh, went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And when I picture that, I picture, you know, some 90-year-old. It's probably my age, <laughs> which I don't like admitting, but, uh, yeah, he was at least uh, back then an old man. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of the three sons that went to battle were Eliab, the first board, and the next was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine, uh, drawing, 
drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now the, thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren. Well, think about that for a moment. And also, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of the thousand and look how they, thy brethren fare and take thy pledge. So grab a whole bunch of flour and, and grab these loaves over here, ten of those, and grab ten cheeses too and load yourself all up and run to the camp. Who knows how many miles that was away, judging from the maps that I see, it was probably a good over 20 miles from Bethlehem. I bet it was exhausting, yes. And again, David shows his humility and his obedience. Because he did what his father said, and not only did he do it, he, he got up early the next morning so he could do it. It takes a while to run 10 to 20 miles, doesn't it? <clears throat> Verse 20. Or actually, I stopped at uh, 18. Now Saul, verse 19, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. Now, as far as I can tell from the description, they're about 20 to 25 miles almost due west of Bethlehem. About two or three miles from the town of Gath. Remember Goliath of Gath? They're right near, Philist right near a Philistine stronghold. <clears throat> and David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper. Notice that little turn of phrase there. Left the sheep with a keeper. He didn't shirk his responsibility and say, oh, <laughs> see a sheep, I'm out of here. No, he made sure that they were tended, that they were cared for. And took and went as Jesse commanded, and he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. <clears throat> and David left his, left his carriage, his, the things he was carrying, in the hands of the keeper of the, of the supplies, the carriage, and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. So, we, as I say, we, we see humility and obedience again. Jesse provided David a demanding task. We see that so we begin to see what God saw in David that he didn't see at least in the same measure as his brothers. Obedience and humility. What's God, what, is, what does other scriptures tell us? What, what does God want from us? To walk humbly before our God. To obey him. To be humble. We see some lessons from David. God was preparing David through being a shepherd to be a great king, to be a great ruler. Great leaders do what's best for their people rather than what's best for themselves. As we continue the story, picking it up in verse 21, or actually verse 23, and as he talked with them, and behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. We read the, those words before. I, Israel, here I am. Are you cowards? Come fight me. Now, let's picture what's going on. We have a hill over here, a cliff. The Israelites are dug in, entrenched. There's a great valley. On the other side, same thing, the Philistines are entrenched on the hill. So, if either side went into the valley, what's going to happen? Well, have you ever played King, King of the Mountain? when you were kids, get up on the top of a terrace, you know, and everybody would try to pull you off. Well, it was a lot easier to push people away from you than for them to pull you off the top of the mountain, right? Out the top of the hill. If you're defending high ground, it's very difficult to get you off of there. Think of the Battle of Bunker Hill. 
Besides that, what did both armies have? They had arrows. So as you're crossing the valley, a whole rainstorm of arrows is coming down. You'll get slaughtered. And if you make it through, then you've got to try to fight entrenched soldiers up to the top of the hill. It was a stalemate. Now, we don't see this in Israel's history, but in ancient times, it was not uncommon for, in that situation, the armies each to send a champion out, and whoever wins, well, then they win. That's what Goliath said. Okay, if we win, you're our slaves. If you win, we'll be your slaves. Well, that was a lie, by the way. They, they had no intention of keeping that promise, as we'll see as we look at the story. Our enemies lie to us. Satan is a deceiver. Goliath was a deceiver. Goliath used psychological warfare against his people, against the people of God. So did, so does our enemy Satan. So the story continues. So David hears the same words that everyone else is hearing. What's the reaction of Israel? Remember, this is day 40. You think they would have gotten used to it by now. You know, on the first day, they, it says that even Saul trembled. King Saul trembling before Goliath? And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that come up? Surely to defy Israel has he come up, and if it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches. You know, the stories start going around. Oh yeah, if we kill him, you know, if someone could actually kill him, you, oh, the king would make him rich and give him his daughter and clothing and house and you name it. A house free in Israel, no taxes. Verse 26, And David spoke to the man that stood by him, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? So he heard and he, he asked again. Hey, David has a purpose in doing this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Buck up, guys! We're the army of the living God. God. Elohim. El, the mighty one. The God who made all things out of nothing by speaking it into power, into, into being. And the people answered him after the matter, saying, So shall it be done with the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the man, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why comest thou down hither? And why hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What now have I done? Is there not a cause? I'm doing this for a purpose. And he turned from him toward another and spake again after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And what happened? Well, eventually word came to King Saul. Hey, there's a guy who's saying, Who will fight? And Saul it's an interesting development. Bring them to me. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, now David was circumspect, he didn't say, now Saul, you don't need to be afraid anymore. I've got this. No, he said, let no man's heart fail. In other words, the army's afraid. I know you're not really afraid, King Saul. The army's afraid. Let no man's heart fail him. Thy servant will go fight with this Philistine. So, we can see some other lessons from what we've, what we've read here. So first of all, skipping back to verse 21. So David again takes care. He was carrying these cheeses, these bread, and, and, and all the rest. What's he do? He, he leaves it with the person responsible for taking care of the supplies. He didn't just go, oh, look, there's a battle, and run. No, he took the time to make sure that the things that he was responsible for we're going to be taken care of. We see his continued obedience. Could David's father Jesse see what he was doing? He had Superman eyes. He could see 20 miles. No. What's God tell us when we're working? Don't obey your boss just when he's looking, but when he's not. 
same thing with our parents, same with anybody that's over authority over us. Again, David shows his obedience and his humility, his responsibility, his diligence. You know, King Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. Well, who taught Solomon? Well, God, but also his father. He saw his father's example. Proverbs 22, 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. His father David the shepherd became the king of Israel and he did stand before kings. Other kings bowed before David. Not the other way around. The lesson we might draw here is that maybe the area of service that we're in right now is not what we would like. Why does so-and-so get uh, to wash the dishes and I have to take out the garbage? Let so-and-so take out the garbage. I'll do the dishes. Whatever it might be. It could be that God's training us. God's preparing us for better service. If not in this life, certainly in life to come. What does God promise us? If we're faithful in little... He's going to make us rulers over much. David was faithful in a little and he became ruler of all of Israel. Second lesson we can draw is don't give in to discouragement. The armies of Israel looked at Goliath and said, oh, who could possibly defeat him? And he's making fun of us. I don't feel good about that hurting my feelings I'm scared imagine if all of Israel attacked Goliath at once yeah some of them probably would have been killed but I imagine they would have taken him out who should have been attacking Goliath Saul we'll see why he didn't in a bit don't succumb to discouragement. Saul and his army certainly had 40 days being taunted. 40 days of psychological warfare. You know, our army today practices psychological warfare. I don't remember uh, there was a, basically a war ward in Panama. We surrounded him and blasted him with light and, and loud heavy metal rock music 24 hours a day. He gave up. He couldn't stand it any longer. Psychological warfare is still used. As I say, our enemy can, can get into our psyches. He can get into our emotions. He can bring us down if we allow him to. <clears throat> so they, the children of Israel, now the, it says that they, were, they would call to war, I imagine what was happening is that each side would try to flank the other side. All right, you sneak down way over there and try to go around across the valley where they can't see and sneak up on the so other side and get behind them. We'll get them. But each side would fight off these skirmishes and it was a stalemate. So day after day, week after week, they sat on their hands and worried and wondered. We don't see Saul crying out to God, Oh God, save us. We don't see anyone praying, asking for the help of God, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. First time David hears it, instead of being scared, what was he? We, we see he was horrified. He was outraged. He tried to get someone This uncircumcised Philistine, what are we going to do about this? He asks and he asks. And finally he begins to realize, I'm going to have to do something about this. Through the help of my God. And then all of a sudden his brother comes in, sees what's going on, draws the wrong conclusion. Maybe David, when he was younger, you know, was an impetuous, impetuous boy and, you know, 
Instead of doing what he was supposed to be doing, he was watching his brothers. Or maybe it was just simply big brother trying to push a little brother down again under his thumb. What I think it was, was, remember, Eliab, Eliab, Eliab El, Elohim, someone of God, he had the right name to be king, but he was rejected, wasn't he? I think two things were going on here. Eliab could have been the one who said, let's go kill this Philistine. He's defied the living God. He was among those who were cowering, wasn't he? Well, my little brother, my baby brother is talking big over here. Better smack him down. He was also rejected as king. You know, when Saul's gone, I want to be king. I'll destroy David's reputation. How can he be king if, if everyone thinks he's, if he's a lazy, insolent brat? We see the first of David's victories here. Because David didn't respond in kind. He could have said, you should talk. You've been cowering here for 40 days. What's wrong with you? He knew that, did he? No, he, he answered softly. Then Solomon in the Proverbs, maybe he learned this from David as well. A soft answer turneth away wrath. We see David in his, in his meekness, his humility again. Notice Eliab in his anger didn't even bother to determine what was the truth. He just assumed that David left those, did you catch it, few sheep, belittling the task, therefore trying to belittle the person. Oh, you just left those few sheep to die, didn't you, David? So you can come up here and, and watch a battle, get your kicks. No. Nope. David didn't respond in kind. He, he had not left the sheep unattended, nor was he seeking his own glory. We'll see that Goliath also resorts to taunting, trying to win a psychological battle against David before the battle even begins. You know, boxing legend, some of you are too young to even probably even know this name, but others will remember Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. Remember the fight against George Foreman, the rope-a-dope? That doesn't hurt, George. Can't you hit harder? Remember, George Foreman was, was feared by all the, all the boxers. He had tremendous punching power. He'd lean back against the ropes. And, Can't you hit harder than that, George? Come on, I thought you were bad. George got madder and madder and swung harder and harder until he wore himself out. We tried to get into an insult match with our enemies we're just going to wear ourselves out George Foreman got knocked out by Muhammad Ali the taunting worked in this case responding negatively only saps our energy doesn't give us any kind of a victory God encourages us to depend on his promises knowing that he'll never forsake us he'll never leave us he's always there for help let us come boldly under the throne of grace that we might find help in time of need. I'm paraphrasing a bit from Hebrews chapter 4. So we see the first victory of David. Instead of responding in kind, he turns away wrath. He bore his provocation with admirable temper. He didn't render railing for railing, evil for evil. No, he... He broke through the discouragement with, with admirable resolution instead. He would not be driven off by thoughts of engaging this huge Philistine, not be, thought, not be uh, driven off by having his brother be mad at him. You know, sometimes we give up because we're afraid somebody's going to get mad at us. Now, if we're in the right, that shouldn't stop us, should it? If we're doing it meekly and humbly, obedience to our God but well, maybe 
maybe David's attitude was right, but in a way, but maybe his attitude was also wrong. Don't teenagers tend to think that they're invincible? Don't they can never die? And sometimes act like that, don't they? Sometimes we act like that, too. But David was not merely being brash here. It was, it was not the brashness of youth. Oh, I can get him. I've killed a lion before. <laughs> I'll get Goliath. No, that's not what, he's, what David was about here. He trusted God and he knew the scriptures. You know, we get little details in the story that aren't there by accident. The writer get, takes pains to say that he's a Philistine from what town? Gath. Gath. And when we look around in the scriptures, we find that Gath was one of the city of the Anakim, or the Anakites. And all the Anakim, or Anakites, were giants. One time there were giants running around, more than one. Cities of them, filled with them. Caleb defeated a city of giants. Well, what did the scripture say? Well, in Deuteronomy, Moses was promised by God that the children of Israel would drive the giants out of the land. Joshua was promised that he would, that Israel would eventually conquer all the way to the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And Israel had driven most of the Anakim away, but they, there were still some cities that were in control of the Philistines. Not all Philistines are giants. But they had as their allies these Anakim. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. You know, the Anakim, probably the Philistines probably at one time were enemies of each other, but now they had a mutual enemy, Israel. So Goliath lived in the Philistine town of Gath, he was a giant. And he really was a giant. If a cubit is 18 inches, then he was 9 feet 6 inches tall. It says he was 6 cubits in a span, a span being half a cubit. There are some scholars who say, oh no, a cubit isn't 18 inches, it's 21 inches, 22 inches. That would make him 11 feet tall. In any case, Goliath was a big man. Think of, think of Felsha Paul, think of the basketball hoop, and imagine someone's head scraping the, the bottom of it. It's a big man. Now, there, are, there have been people that have been that big. But most of the time when we see them this big, it's because of a genetic defect that makes them grow real tall, but they're weak, sickly, die young. Goliath was not weak, nor was he sickly. He was a big, strong, nasty man. His armor, and I see I'm running out of time, his armor weighed over 150 pounds. I'm not sure if you put 150, well, you know, I've had people on my back who are 150 pounds, but I wouldn't want to have to fight a battle with 150 pounds on me. On me. Different references, his spear, which they say was as big as a weaver's rod, in other words, the, the, one of the rods that holds all the weight of all the fiber of the cloth that's being woven, so maybe about this big around, and anywhere from seven to one reference said, oh, it's about 22 feet long. Not sure how, you, how you'd, well you'd wield a spear that that was long. But the, the tip of it, the iron tip, we're told, was five, 6,000 shekels, which is 15 pounds. Have you ever taken a baseball bat, a baseball bat, and swung it? 36 ounce bat is hard to swing. That's three pounds. The tip of this spear was 15 pounds. He was a big, strong man. He was 
dressed in the finest military garb, military defensive wear that money could buy. He trained to be a soldier from his youth. He knew all the tricks. He knew all the techniques. I'm going to have to skip some here. So David goes to Saul. Saul says, I can imagine him kind of chuckling. Oh, David. You brave, brave boy. You foolish, foolish boy. You're a kid. He's a giant. You see the outcome here? I don't want you to throw away your life. So David doesn't respond to him in spiritual terms because Saul doesn't think in spiritual terms. He thinks in human terms. Humanly speaking, David didn't stand a chance. So David says, okay, Saul, I'll come to your level. Well, when I was a shepherd... And a lion came and took the lamb. I went and grabbed the lamb out of the lion's mouth, and when he reared on me, I grabbed him by the mane, I hit him with my rod, and I killed him. Wouldn't catch me doing that, as I said. I'd be out of there. I wouldn't even do it against a bear, much less a lion. He killed a bear, too. Probably more than one. Here he is, and he's all this me time he didn't give in to despair didn't give in to oh why did my father stick me with this job here for days and months and years just me and these dumb old sheep no he used his time he meditated on God he apparently knew God's word because we see throughout the Psalms that he quotes it and he also honed his skills spent hour after hour practicing with that slingshot. You know, they say that Davy Crockett would take a rifle and hit a squirrel in the eye from 100 yards away or something. David was just as good with his slingshot. You learn from experience. So don't take rough stones because when they're in flight and, there's, and there's, they're spinning, the wind resistance will throw it off, of course. No, take smooth stones. What's the story tell us? David took five smooth stones, put them in his bag. You know, Saul said, okay, you're, if you insist on going, at least go prepared. Here, here's my arm. But David had never used that before. He said, I've, I've never tried it. I, I, I know how to fight with that. I know how to fight with my rod. I know how to fight with my sling. And we know David later as a warrior definitely used armor. Well, as we can assume he did. He fought battles. But this time, he had not trained in that. We need to take what God has given us, the abilities that God has given us, and use them for his glory. That's what David did. And David didn't say, I, look at me, I killed a lion, I killed a bear, I'm going to go get him. No, he said, I'll be able to kill, David, kill Goliath because I've got the God who keeps his word. The God of the armies of Israel behind me. So out to the battlefield they go. And here, here's Goliath. He's sitting down with his, with his um, shield bearer. Yeah. Well, you look at that. Forty days and here, here comes somebody. and Gets close enough that he could see him better. It's a kid. He's coming. He doesn't have a sword. He's coming with a rod. What's wrong with you? You dare to come to me? You think I'm a dog? On each time, dogs were the lowest of the low. You think I'm a dog? You beat me with a stave and I'm going to run off yelping? You better run, kid. I'm going to kill you. When I'm done with you, I'm going I'm to break your body up and I'm going to feed it to the birds. He cursed him by the gods of 
the Philistines, the powerless idols of the Philistines, the same gods before whom all of Israel was cowering. And David looked at him and said, You're defying the God of Israel. And I'm going to defeat you by that God. And everyone's going to know, including my cowards behind me. He didn't say that, but there's the implication. They're going to know there's God in Israel. And he went and won better. He said, I'm not only going to kill you, we're going to kill all your friends too, and we're going to feed them all to the birds. And we know that's exactly what happened. So apparently Goliath was sitting down and so, all right, he gets up. You asked for it. Now you're going to get it. David runs forward. He slings his sling. Now, remember, great big brass helmet, coat of mail, greaves on his legs. No part of his body should be able to be hit. And yet, apparently, maybe he didn't have his helmet all the way planted correctly. Maybe he got so mad he rears up and his helmet flies up a little bit, leaving just a little bit of space exposed. David takes aim, and through the hand of God, smacks him right where he could be hit. Goliath falls down. David runs up. Remember, David said, God doesn't save the battles of the Lord. God doesn't save by sword and spear. Yet we're told that David cut Goliath's head off. With what? With Goliath's own sword. Big, heavy sword that he couldn't wield with one hand. He had to take two. And, oh! his head off. Picked his head up. Showed it to all of Israel. This is what our God can do. Israel roars and the Philistines didn't do what they said they were going to do. They didn't say, oh, we give up. We're our slaves. Remember he had his, his armor bearer there? you think the armor bearer would, you killed my buddy Goliath, I'm going to kill you! No, he runs off. Never heard from him again. Guess he was killed. Who knows? Israel won, won a great victory. You know what? There's giants in our lives. Giants of despair. Giants of school. Giants of relationships. Giants of an unreasonable boss. Whatever the giants we face in our lives. Is our guard bigger than that giant? I think he is. I know he is. Our God is almighty. Our God cannot be defeated. What giants are in our lives? Let's give them over to our God. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you're bigger than our giants. Lord, help us to defeat them. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.